Inside the Kennel Podcast, Dougie, welcome, mate. How are you going? I'm going well, Paul, Matty. Um, going along beautifully, and I'm, I'm looking forward to speaking about our next guest because this bloke could play footy. And we've got to remember, Matty, of course, Matty. Matty, welcome back. How are you travelling, mate? And tell us a little bit about how, how amazing guest we have today. Yeah, I'm going absolutely fantastically. This time of the year, I'm always excited because uh, footy season is just about to kick in. So, um, you know, I, I am, I'm supercharged and, and extra excited tonight because we have got 325 game triple premiership player, Brownlow medalist, um, and then Bulldog player, Jason Ackermanis. Uh, how good is that? Amazing, uh, Matty Poor, amazing. Um... Amazing journey that Acker had had been on, and, and a, an amazing player that he has been. Amazing um, person and character. Uh, and as as we all know, that when you you um, you get a football player, you get everything. You get the package, not just a footy player. You get the character. You get the knockabout sort of bloke in, in a way that he he may have been. Um, but as we know, and all of our um, watchers know. Mate, could Acker play? Could he play footy? He played four seasons at the club, which is quite substantial. He had a, was it, Matty, did you say a 16-year career, a 16-season career? Yeah, that's right. And, you know, the last four with us, 70 games, 114 goals. But, you know, it was more than that, more than just, you know, those raw stats. He he just brought an insatiable um, hunger to win the ball. And you knew whenever the ball was there, to be one, Acker was going to be in the thick of it and fight tooth and nail. And I, I just think he really inspired people, uh, supporters, and, and uh, teammates alike. What do you think, Doug? You know what you know what he was, boys. You know what he was. Um, in my opinion, he would be in the best two or three kicks both sides of the body that I've seen play. Uh, not just at the Bulldogs. Bulldogs, obviously, in my time, I had. Uh, Teddy Whitten Jr. was very good before his knee uh, finished his career. Uh, Michael McLean was fantastic. Um, and this bloke, Jason Akamanis, uh, both sides. Did I say Leon Cameron? I didn't say Leon Cameron, did I? Leon Cameron, both feet, was as good as... Amazing. <laughs> probably good as Teddy Whitten and Michael McLean. I just mentioned Leon Cameron. He was magnificent, both sides of the body. Uh, but Akamanis for his size, Jason Akamanis for his size. And, and the thing about Akka... Uh, being a natural right footer, he, he could kick the ball 60 metres off two steps on his left foot, off two steps. That, that's hard to do that. That is very, very hard to do that. And he's a player that could do that. And he was just an outstanding player. And you talk about that midfield at Brisbane, mm. you know, with Vossi both sides of the body. Um, Simon Black didn't have to because he's a right footer, a left footer. Uh, just a natural left foot, and the boy uh, Lappin, who's a, both sides of the body as well. Yeah. Uh, it's a brilliant midfield, isn't it? Unbelievable. Um, you know, and and he, he later in his career, obviously at Brisbane, he, you know, he, he went forward in two thousand and three, the grand final. There, he snagged five goals. He, <laughs> he should have won a, a Norm Smith. We talk about Tommy Boyd as well. You know, he's another one that just narrowly missed out. And then he comes to the dogs and just tears it apart. Like he kicked 42 goals in, in the 2008 season, 49 in 2009. They had two pre prelim years and were, you know, within an inch of just getting through. In the maze and poor, Matty, you know, we, 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 we talk about Acker and again, we get the full package. And that, that Brisbane midfield, as I just touched on before, out of those four names, including um, the boy Lappin, three Brownlow medalists. Yeah. They had three Brownlow medalists in that midfield. No wonder Lee Matthews was happy coaching them. I wouldn't be happy coaching a side like that. Uh, and, 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 and again, Aki, you're, you're going to get that amazing goal, left or right foot, um, the tackle from behind when he chased and tackled. He, he was a full, a full package as a, as a player, uh, not just the flair and the, you know, the, the, the razzmatazz and the brilliance. Uh, he had tackle and chase and harass. Um, he was just an old rap when he went to the Bulldogs. Yeah. And I, I didn't I, I didn't like the way things finished at the Bulldogs, boys. Is that fair to say? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah it, was a, it was a, you know, very sad ending for what was just, you know, a flamboyant and fantastic career to sort of end on that sour note. It just didn't suit. Yeah, Paul, Matty, I, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong here. Um, some of the senior guys weren't happy about him doing handstands. Is that correct? I think it was more about um, some of the oversharing that was happening in the media. And, you know, he, he, he's not one to take a backward step. As you know, Doug, you've, you've done sportsman's nights with him. You know, he speaks his mind. Yeah. I think Matty Paulie was trying to set himself up in the media. He, he knew that his career at AFL footy at the Bulldogs was not just the Bulldogs, but AFL was coming towards the end. Yeah. And, he, and he got to be controversial a little bit as well and all that sort of stuff. And I, I, I just didn't like the way it finished for a, a, such a brilliant champion player that he was. And I, I, I would say this, if, if I was captain of the Western Bulldogs and Acker wanted to do a handstand, win, draw, or lose, guess what? He does a handstand. Yeah. Doesn't worry me. I, I like blokes who have got a bit of razzmatazz and a bit of flair, and and they're going to do the unpredictable thing. Well, that's what he's about. The unpredictable thing. You're right, Doug. You bring a bloke like that on, you you accept him for all, all that he is. He's not a young player. You, you can't, you know, an old dog can't change their spots. See, if if that's what you brought him, you brought him to the club. You bring him for his warts and warts and all. Surely, hundred percent, Paul. So I, I was disappointed. Uh, Matty, Paul, I was just disappointed just the way that it ended for him at the Bulldogs. And and, and I don't know the whole story. You boys probably know a bit more than me. But um, it, him as, as a footballer, it wasn't many better. Again, I, I left out Darren Jarman, both sides of the feed, was just magnificent, as was his brother. Andrew Jarman was just magnificent as well. Uh, but a bloke of that size kicking the ball off two steps left foot was just, was just amazing. It really was. And... Uh, uh, and he's, and he's, and he's, he's res, his record now after his career's over, uh, as good as anyone in it. it it's, you know, it's a three premier, three, yeah, three in a row. Yeah. Three in a Round row. row. Probably, probably won a couple. They win a couple of best and fairest at Brisbane or not? I have to ask him that. I, I would, assume, you know, I'd find it incredible if he didn't. Yeah, he did I wonder how he went the year under Brownlow, Matty, Paul. I wonder how he went, wonder how he went the year under Brownlow. I wonder how he went in the uh, BNF. I've seen brilliant players over my time before I started and, Obviously, when I play, do some brilliant things. But he, he would do that uncanny thing, wouldn't he? He'd do that thing that you'd look and go, how good was that? How'd he do that? And then someone would say, he did that last week when he played against <laughs> against Geelong. and did it the week before against Carlton. He did things on a regular thing that you would be, as a player, you'd look back and you'd go, how in the hell did he do that? How'd he do that? How'd he get out of that traffic? to get to where he got to. And uh, and obviously with that, he, he brought the flair. And I, I love that. I love blokes who who play footy with that flair and that, you know, that shade of arrogance and that cockiness and got that bit of a stroll. I love that. And I don't want to – I never, ever took that away from any guys that I play with as long as they backed it up. Yeah. As long as they backed it. If they walked the walk, talked the talk, whatever you want to call it, he did it, didn't he? He talked the talk and walked the walk. Simple. Yep, he walked the walk, he even handstand the walk at times. <laughs> and um, he was, uh, it was incredible to watch. We loved him and we loved characters of the 80s. He brought it through to the 90s and beyond. And, um, you know, let's, let, let's have a few more of those characters, Doug, because they, they bring people through the, uh, through the turnstiles. He's a star, Matty Paul. He's a star. And if anyone says he wasn't, well, guess what? They know nothing about footy because he was a genuine oh. uh, superstar. And uh, in a team of superstars, just, Dougie, yeah. Well, there's not many superstars out there, but I'm going to label that bloke Akamanis, Jason Akamanis, is a superstar. And he brought he gave us joy, he gave us a lot of things that we look and go, Oh, geez. Um, he, he was just a full package on and off the ground. I loved him as a player, and I loved him as a bloke. He's a, he's a great person, he's a great character. And I'm shocked that he didn't get involved in some coaching somewhere in the AFL where. I reckon he would have been a very, very good coach. Yeah, a brilliant skills coach, I'm sure. Doug, Doug I can hear the doorbell ringing. That's oh, there he is. Well, there he is. <laughs> Dougie, he's, ringing it. he's yeah. ringing it with the back of his heel because he's doing a handstand, Dougie. It's ringing. Well, I did, Paul. Good you, Matty. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Ladies and gentlemen, we don't have too many people on this podcast with the resume pedigree of this fella. Listen to this. 325 AFL games, 16 seasons in the AFL, two best and fairest, one in a premiership year, two leading goal kicker, 
three state reps, four times all Australian. I'm going to keep going. AFL, AFL, I think it's life membership there. Hall of Fame inductee. There's more to come. A Brownlow medal. Uh, if he was born in England, he would have been knighted by now. Uh, Queensland team of the century. Arguably the greatest player to come out of Queensland. And I'm talking about Nick Reedwald and Jason Dunstall on that list. Um, we have one Jason Ackermanis. Acker, welcome to Inside the Podcast, mate. G'day, fellas. Yes, that's. Uh, I did have a fairly long career, and it was a good career. So it, uh, it it still amazes me. Sometimes you think, did that even happen? You know, you've, I've been retired now for thirteen years. So yeah, it just goes, and life moves on. Did I leave anything else, Acker? Did I leave it I, out? Anything? I'm else? in four. I'm in four Hall of Fames, but that's about it. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm that's the, all we uh, have time for, I think, Acker. Yeah, that's it. Forty-five minutes done. Now I'm in. I'm in the Queensland Sporting Hall of Fame, the uh, Queensland Aussie Rules Hall of Fame, the Brisbane Lions Hall of Fame, of course, the AFL Hall of Fame. I think my life's pretty much peaked at thirty-nine. It was <laughs> seven years ago. I can't do any better. Well, that's what they say about geniuses, Acker, don't they? They always say the best work's done when they're young. Apparently, yeah. Well, I'm uh, forty-six tomorrow, so it should be uh, it should be an interesting forty-six year coming up. Brilliant, Macca. Well, happy birthday. We always start um, our show off by asking our guests in their own words to describe themselves. And we want you to put um, modesty aside here. In the most colourful language, how would you describe your career for people who maybe never got to see you play? Well, thankfully, you've got YouTube and stuff these days. I feel sorry for the guys who played in the 60s and 70s where it wasn't around. But I think I was the best kick that ever played on both feet. And I think I was the best finisher uh, for goal. I don't think anyone could really kick the way I could kick both feet. And then of course, towards goal, I was I incredibly accurate. So I, I, I don't think I'd ever win the, the toughest player award or anything like that. I wasn't really big enough. I couldn't really bust packs. Uh, I wasn't a bad mark, but I certainly was an outstanding kick. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Well, Dougie actually in his intro that we've just recorded has said that he rates you um, at, and Leon Cameron and, and Teddy Whitten is the best exponent by foot that he's that he's ever seen. So, you know, you're in good company there at very least. You're on the podium. Yeah, I saw Dougie last Friday. We had a coffee. He was up here doing a speaking engagement for the function I did the year before at Aspley Hornets. So it was good to see Dougie, although he's, you know, he's in his 80s now, so he's, he's getting on a bit. <laughs> and talking about coffee, Acker, it's nice to know you're, you're on the stuff, mate, because you told a funny story about Lee Matthews putting you on coffee in the early days. And and you said you had the tremble, so it's nice to know you. You know you eventually enjoyed the stuff. Yeah, well, when he we'd always get in trouble. Uh, well, I was always in trouble, and so Phil Jauncey, our psychologist, said you got to take him to a neutral venue, which of course was a coffee shop. And I never had coffee. And then I, I think uh, I said, what, what coffee should I have, Lee? And he said, Oh, why don't you try the cappuccino? It's got chocolate. Oh, geez, I was I had that many coffees. I remember waking up about 2 a.m. with the shakes and I worked out that it was because I was having so many coffees from never having coffees, except maybe no dose on game day. Yeah, I was in that much trouble. <laughs> now, look, I, I want to talk about where you got your love for the game. I mean, a lot of this is well documented, but I just, I want to, from a, a football enthusiast, want to know what was sort of the pathways in Queensland? Now, Victoria is the, the mecca of, of football in Australia, but Queensland at that time, even back then, what were the pathways that got you into the game and produced Voss, it produced Black? What, what, what were the pathways? Who, who were your influences? Who were your mentors? Right back to when you were a kid. Well, Queensland is always an interesting one because most people don't know that Queensland Aussie Rules is actually way bigger than people think, and it's been big for a long time. It it probably doesn't get the credit that it uh, deserves in the sense of, I mean, there are great players who've come out of Queensland, but the local competition, the competition I came through, which was the QAFL back then, is incredibly strong competition. I mean, we always got a lot of guys coming to Queensland, a lot of guys playing. I played for Maine. So what would happen? You'd have under 12s. Uh, back then, they had under 14s, none of this half age is crap that they've got these days. 14s, 15s, and then 17s. 17s, of course, was Till Cup, which is uh, is the under 18s carnival now. But yeah, so that was your general progression. So pretty much if you're a really good junior, you made those teams. There's very few. In fact, I remember 1988, I played, uh, I was 11. I played in the under 12 state side. We went to Darwin. 
Uh, we won. It was the very first Queensland team that ever won. Wow. And out, out of that team, five guys from that team played in the AFL. So you had myself, Clark Keating, a guy called Brent Green, who's passed away now, Clint Bizzle and Hamie Simpson. So that's how strong you just get a bit lucky, but that uh, being the youngest of that team, the following year, we weren't near as good, but you know, I mean, Clark Keating and I, I mean, he lives around the corner from my office. So I see him most days. Like it's crazy to think that as the 11 year old, that's where it all kind of wow. starts. And, and all of us that were really good. There's only two players that ever played that, Played with, they both had red hair or played against who were good enough to play in the AFL. It was a guy called Reese Fullick, a guy called Andrew Bell. They were outstanding players. And they, uh, the three of us redheads in that age group and the one above were probably the best players in there. But unfortunately, they didn't quite get uh, the looks that they would now. They would be in the AFL system yeah. now. But okay. uh, so that's how, you, that's how you get through and get in. And who were some of the, who were some of the, the coaches? Acker that that you know did you get Victorian players that came up there and, and coached who were some of the people that really influenced you well we had a we had a guy um John Klug his name was he played for Adelaide huge hands he, he was coaching Maine when I I ended up coming through my influences were a lot, of, a lot of the local guys that you never heard of but you know I was I was really lucky I came into Maine a huge club Andrew Island was sort of uh you know from Maine it was very big becomes the CEO of the Lions eventually you know, the, all the power brokers for some reason came from Maine, which is why they had the grand final for so many years. But those guys, we had guys who were state-level players come up from Tasmania and South Australia. We had SANFL players. So we didn't have a lot of VFL players. I think there was more money back then to go to, say, a Myrtleford or, you know, Albury or somewhere like that. There's, and there's lots of those little country leagues around there. But, you know, I, I had these crazy guys who were still mates of mine called the Tap Brothers and... Uh, I, I'm not sure if they actually wanted to protect me, but they just basically beat the crap out of anyone who gave me a lot of grief. And I would get tagged even as a 17 year old playing in the QFL. So yeah. that they, they were my guys, you know, and I'm still, I'm still glad I'm great mates with them now, but how could you not be mates with guys who would look after you like yeah, that? You know, that's right. And obviously no one was an obstacle in the sense of your coaching, stopping you from being who you were. Clearly you were mandated to play the style you wanted to play. Would that be true? Well, I sort of, because I remember I actually, while I was an outstanding forward, I sort of started in the seniors as a back pocket. So I went back pocket, then eventually uh, midfield and then forward. And then with the lines, it was, it was similar, you know, I was sort of forward, half forward, but eventually I went to the back line in 99. People forget that I actually played a lot of, a lot of time in the back line because I was a good kick. Obviously I was great setting up play, but kicking in. So yeah, the the long story of the, of, of the short is, it was that was that was a very hard place to uh, to get to to actually learn your craft, and because I find a lot of the really good kids generally are playing against men much earlier. I still think the the under 18s competition has the best kids, but playing against men really helped me a lot. Absolutely. So, Jason, we want to talk a fair bit about the Bulldogs today, but we will start off a little bit about your time at Brisbane. You know, playing in an incredibly um, successful era with three premierships why was your team so good and how as you as an individual how were you able to excel and thrive in that environment well, there's a couple of reasons we were very good we had uh you need a bit of fortune but we had probably the bulk of our really good players were only a few years apart so by the time you know within 18 months you've got myself michael voss chris scott nigel lap and justin Lepage just to name a few. So they're all within 18 months. And so we came last in 99. The, the things that really helped that group, obviously having Lee Matthews, who was a wonderful coach, but the one thing that, that Lee did, he got the great medical guys in and the physios, which was important, but he also got Phil Jauncey in. Phil Jauncey was working at the club, but Phil was the guy that Lee just took to him. And, and I think without Phil Jauncey, Lee Matthews, was never going to get the best out of each and every player because it's the personalities are so different. And so I think that progression for, so you've got the right age. Uh, I mean, I won the brand low, I was 24. So you've got 24, 25, 26. And those other guys are only a year older than me, except for really Lynch. He was in his mid fifties by the time he got there, he was sort of 30, 35, 36, 37. So yeah, it was all those, all those things. I mean, 
we only really, I think we only had 26 players played in the three premierships. So yeah. you had a really good group, but you had a really strong group. But we also, I mean, from the team that come last, we pretty much traded out uh, Jared Malloy and we got Mal Michael. Oh, that yeah. was wonderful. And then we were able to pick up pretty cheap Martin Pike. So that'll show you that, that really Desi Headland did play in a premiership the next year in 2002. But it just shows you, like, you know, that was still there. How you come last, it just shows you a different coach and a little bit of timing and whew, up you go. Yeah. Now, Aki, you were an, an iconic figure for your footy club. You were central to to the uh, Lions branding and you moved to the Bulldogs. So, uh, you know, your movement from one club to another, in my opinion, is, you know, akin to Kerry moving to Adelaide, Cousins moving from Eagles to Richmond. I mean, that's how big your name was. So, Tell us how you went to the Bulldogs. How did that happen? Um, they weren't a huge club in the league as far as a Carlton or a Collingwood. How did that unfold for you? Yeah, so what happened, obviously, uh, in the middle of 2006, Lee and I decided that's it. He, he just basically it was me and him. There was none of the players involved. And I was quite fortunate because one of the guys who was my assistant coach, a guy called Darren Creswell, is very, very good mates with the 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 coach at the time, Rodney Ede. And I don't think I would have gone to the Bulldogs if it wasn't for their relationship. And I really mean that. Not that the, the their deal was the best deal, but I think the the convincing part, because at that stage, I was 30 years of age, still playing great footy, uh, won the best and fairest at Brisbane the year before, uh, kicking lots of goals, doing great things. But I started to have a a bit of a stench about my name because I like, oh, he's unmanageable, he's unworkable. It's just, just complete shit. So I think Darren, Kreza really helped Rodney understand that that's not the case and that he should take a chance on me. So in the end, it came down to two clubs. One was the Bulldogs, one was Essendon. And I, I'll tell you categorically, there's a big difference between the two. At the time, uh, the Bulldogs had just won their first final against Collingwood. Great game. Mm. obviously we didn't play in the finals my first year, but we weren't far away. And then we played in free prelims. So, you know, it, it seemed like a better list. Uh, Essendon had Kevin Chitty at the time. Now, Kevin and I would have gone on fine, but I had a sneaking gut feeling that they were going to sack Kevin in the next, you know, couple of years. It turns out he got sacked the year after, and then they brought in Matty Knights. And that's that was a mitigated disaster at that age because when new coaches come in, they – they, they just work you and work you. And at 30, I needed a, a program that was going to suit me. And then the other reality was the Bulldogs had a three-year deal for $450,000 a year, which, believe it or not, that was a, a big step up in wage. I mean, today it's probably, you know, ashtray money. But back then, that was my biggest earning as a footballer. So, you know, and the Essendon Footy Club had two years at four hundred grand a year. So you, you could see a three-year, one hundred and 150 grand difference was, wasn't that difficult. Better list. Uh, Essendon just just didn't quite, you know, suit me. So I wasn't far off. I could have gone to Geelong, but it, it just the money wasn't right. Well, did you thanks. understand or did you know about the culture? What was your understanding of the culture and, and branding of the dogs? Yeah, well, I played against the dogs for a lot of years. But when, when I went down there, Campbell Rose was the CEO. And he actually did a great job. He said, look, you can see the facilities antiquated, old. They're all going. They're going. Here's the master plan. This is where we're going. And that was really important because I could see the future. He could sell the future. And at that stage, there wasn't any big names going to the Bulldogs. It was pretty simple. They were a lowly rated club with low memberships, not a great power base, um, you know, I mean, back not not far, you know, before I came and many years before that, they couldn't play players, and it was oh, it was it was a real club that you just never wanted to go to unless you were born in the area, got drafted there. And it was it was not going to happen. So I knew about uh, you know such a strong culture being around, very successful in the VFA, but of course uh, only one premiership at that stage. So look. In the end, I wanted to win another flag, naturally, at 30. In the end, if it wasn't a money decision or a, a good deal, Geelong would have, would have won another four. But I think the reality was it was just the best decision. And everything about it at the time had a really strong leadership group, you know, Brad Johnson all the way down. And they had good up-and-coming players, Adam Cooney, et cetera. So it was, it was an easy decision. 
Yeah, so when you walk through the doors, who was it that you've bonded with and um, what sort of teammates stood out to you when, uh, when you arrived, Dakar? Well, by accident, I think. No one really stood out. I, I stated uh, Daniel G. Syracuse's house and Robert Murphy, and I, I don't mind those guys, but I, was, I wasn't really clicking with those guys. They were a little bit, uh, you know, doing their own thing, if you know what I mean. That Nothing nothing bad about them, but that's just the way they, they are. They're pretty tight, those two at that time. They still are. So... It wasn't really, I mean, I got on well with Brad Johnson, uh, but because they didn't really know me, and I mean know me, because those guys in Brisbane saw me as a lunatic 17-year-old come all the way through yeah. to a 30-year-old, and they understood. They, they were there. Yeah, they were there at my mum's funeral. They knew They knew my past. They knew how what made me tick. So it was a little bit different going there as a mature person. But by accident, I got uh, roomed with a guy who was playing in – the back line, a guy called Dale Morris. And because the lines, you would stay at, in your own room, but with the Bulldogs, you had to pay extra anyway. And the club would pay that the line. So I naturally said, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. And plus you need someone to talk to Dale Morris and I become uh, best mates uh, wow. in the club. So he was my best mate in the club. He lives up here now, not far from where I live and we're still very close, but that was, that was an accident. I just didn't realize what a fantastic, person dale is um Aka, were, was there I, I could imagine players at a new club being in awe of you or even even intimidated was that it did you have that sense or feeling from some players when a when a, a player with such an immaculate resume and achievements walks into their club was there a feeling that you had about about that a little bit but i think it's not so much that they're they're intimidated as far as uh you being there it's more they're watching you. They're just watching everything you're doing. You, you know, there's other players who just blend it in the background, but there's no way, not just because of my blonde hair, it's because of the profile, the way I trained, the way I recovered, the way I ate, everything. They were, and naturally younger players would always be trying to learn what they could from you. And that was, that was pretty much the way it was. Even some of the older players, you know, who were good players at the time, you know, Scotty West and these guys, they're still watching you, seeing how you perform, see how you fit in. And that was really what I noticed. And I, I think what hurt me was trying to be so good in that first preseason. I finished that preseason in, in great shape. You know, I was pretty much gassed after that. I was, I was too skinny and I wasn't as strong and I was sick all the time. So, yeah, that was a, even at 30, it was a good little lesson. You can't please everyone and you've got to pace yourself and that's the way it is. Yes. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your relationship with um, with Rocket Eid? Um, you mentioned him a little earlier. Um, did he sort of call upon your um, premiership credentials? Um, did he take advantage of your knowledge and expertise there or um, or was that something that was just parked? No, no, they didn't take advantage of it and that was probably the most disappointing part of it. And it, it wasn't just that Rodney didn't sort of want to draw it out, but it was actually the senior players who just said, no, 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 we, we don't want to know. And and I said, guys, there's a couple of things you need to realize is that everyone's an individual. And particularly when it came down to things like the handstand and stuff, I said, you know, there was a bit of angst amongst the group. And I said, well, you know, we are all individuals. We you can't play this game, which they were about everyone's got to be, it was literally like a robot situation. I said, this is the dumbest thing you can do. I mean, you need your natural flair. You need your leaders. You need your, this is why it's important to know the difference. So I, I, I didn't not, not say anything either. I certainly was very vocal when I needed to be, but I think that was a, a little bit disappointing, but Rodney, Rodney had been successful enough as a coach. He'd, he'd been to grand finals. It wasn't like uh we don't know what's going on, but occasionally there was the odd question. What was it like? How did you do it there? And I would impart my wisdom, but it wasn't really something that they, I think they took full advantage of. They didn't do that. Mm. Uh, Aki, you finished in the first season, you finished 13th at the club, not the winning sort of culture that you're used to. How did you deal with that challenge? And, and clearly this sort of adds on to what you just said then. What changed in 2008 and, 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 you know, what the beginning of what three consecutive preliminary final campaigns? Well, what happened was the club had a review. I don't know if you remember that. They had a review and uh, Rodney wasn't very happy with it. Uh, David Smorgan had his mitts all over it as David does because he loves the limelight and stuff. But he, the review was good. I went in and spoke to them and it was pretty clear. I just said to them straight out, I said, we are overtrained. 
Rodney thinks we're teams of the 80s who were always overtrained. I mean, even when I had Wolsey in the 90s, it was horrible. I mean, you you couldn't play well on the weekends because you're completely gassed from just the training during the week. I mean, you know, Rodney would have us doing 45 an hour the day before a game, like sessions. That's just dumb, like crazy. So I was very, very vehement that if we're going to succeed, he needs to back off the training at the right time. We trained so hard. It was it was almost embarrassing how fit we weren't on the weekends considering how good we trained mostly during the week. It was just stupid. Anyway, that's what changed. The list improves. We start winning. The culture changes as far as, you know, your habits. But it was, I think it was just categorically over training. And once they got rid of that, Rodney looked like a really great coach, but it was actually him who was causing us to finish so far down the ladder. Yeah, right. So 2008 then, what a season. Um, you know, it was the start of, as Paul's just said, three consecutive prelims. And you yourself kicked 49 goals, which I think was equal to your sort of career high. You did that at Brisbane as well. Um, tell us about that campaign that year and particularly like how you just shined um, in the spotlight. I think it really started in the preseason. I remember I had a run-in with Adam Cooney, who went on to win the Brownlow that year. And Coons and I, uh, we're, in a, we're having a match simulation. And Coons just gets really upset with me because I was tagging him. And uh, and then he wanted to, like, punch me. I said, Coons, if you can't handle me, mate, you're not going to be able to handle taggers out there because they're worse than me. I said, you're a super player. What you need to do is just run. Run. Just use that unbelievable speed you've got. And to his credit, you know, things like him improving so much, I, it's not because of what I did that day. It's because he he took the responsibility that it is an honour to be tagged. I need to use my natural talents. And he was fantastic. So the whole game plan, the way Rodney <laughs> – Rodney's great. He's probably the best uh, coach for scoring because he's like – Let's just kick goals. We 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 have 131 points and they have 130. We win. Let's get the ball on. And so as a forward and playing in a forward line like that, the ball is coming in. And we had no big forward until Barry Hall came a couple yeah, of years later. Yeah. So we had a lot of small, very agile, good marking players from from Scotty Welch to you know Brad Johnson myself. So we 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 just needed in one on one. We didn't need packs and. And that was that was the reason we just played a beautiful brand of footy. So you finished third that year, Acker, and, and you had a real we had a real uh, shot at Geelong in the prelim. Did you sense the group was starting to grow and mature, and maybe you were starting to influence some of the culture in the team? I don't think I was directly. No doubt, my finishing ability and everything else was starting to rub off. I think the training standards and everything I was doing, there's a, there's a few hard trainers in there, don't get me wrong. So it's the culture was already strong, but I think with winning becomes expectation. I think the reality, they actually farthened the expectation after they made that final and they won that final. We went backwards a bit. Excuse me. And I think the, the prelim, when you get into a prelim, it's really uh, for the first time players they go we're one game away from a grand final like it's just you you take your eye off the prize it's really easy to do so i think that experience was awesome big stage big crowd but you know it, it just gives you a bit of belief i mean i played for 16 years i played in nine prelims pretty much and that that if you play in prelims you're in good teams like to have nine years of your 16 years in such strong teams is and i think the players started to realise that they are starting to become a powerhouse. So it was only a matter of time before we'd we'd nearly get there. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, not necessarily a missed opportunity, but, a, you know, a stepping stone in 2008. And I guess, you know, 2009 came around and um, it felt to me as a, you know, as a, a fan that this was our year. We kind of had everything sort of falling into place, the right age profile, maybe lacking sort of a tall forward. And I'm sure you'll talk about Barry who came a year later, maybe one year too late. But at that time, you had established players around you like, you know, Jono and, and Murphy and Gian Syracuse. What was it like, the synergy between sort of the small forwards who had, you know, a, a lot of experience behind them at that time? What was it like playing with those sort of chaps? Well, it was a bit different. I mean, I, I played with Lynchy and Brady who were, and, and Jonathan Brown, who were those big, solid, uh, you know, full forwards, centre forwards. And I would crumb off them and get a lot of goals that way. But, of course, now... 
as it was the following year. I mean, I was a leading target, very good overhead for Masai. So for myself and John, John is exceptional above his head. Like it's amazing, Mark. And guys who are so creative, you can kick goals. You know, GS was, was a great example. You know, he'd kick his 25, 30. Just a, that's just the talent to get on the end of, of good chains of, of play. So I, I don't know, it was different, but, you know, you couldn't be, as it was in Brisbane, you know, either – accepting the ball and kicking a goal or crumbing and kicking goals, uh, all of a sudden I'm a marking forward. And I think I think for a long time I'd say the coaches are very good overhead and they just, you know, Robert Walls and these kind of coaches didn't want to know about it, didn't want to exploit the opposition's weakness. I mean, I'm not a guy same size. I'm going to outmark him eight times out of ten. And yeah, they just never do that. It was just a traditional big forwards and mark. It was it, it was it wasted four years of my career with with poor coaching and didn't realise your talent. So that was really cool to play in that group. And it was really cool to play with a forward line that was so versatile and very difficult. A lot of opposition coaches said it's very hard to match up on. And I, I could see why, because you couldn't have your big guys. You needed to be quick and agile and, and nimble. But if you weren't, you know, the, we would kick a lot of goals. We, I don't know how many times we kicked over hundred points, but it was a lot. Um, in 2009, we had an incredible season, didn't we? We won 15 games. It was probably arguably our best shot in the flag in decades. Can you talk us through that campaign and um, and what unfolded that year? Well, just last year, I was talking to Rodney Ead and he said of all the easy coach, that's the team he, he, he thought could win it. And he's right. Unfortunately, uh, everything was in place. Everything was going well. We get to the finals. Uh, we play uh, St Kilda. There's a couple of things wrong that would, wouldn't have happened. And we're, you should feel unlucky if you're a Bulldogs fan. We have a decision that I think I get done for deliberate out of bounds, which was a joke. It just rolled and dribbled. And and then later uh, we go down, Revolt kicks a goal that Jared Harbrow touched. Now I, I could see it on the ground and the umpires, of course, with the noise and stuff, no reviews. Not only do we, does that get touched and we get the ball, we, we go down and, and we would win that game and we'd be in a grand final. That's, that's the sadness of how good that team was and how close it was. Don't get me wrong. Um, there was a couple of things in that game that we needed to adjust quicker. We had Revolt sorted. He marked all the time in the lead. So the first half, Dale Morris just 10 metres in front of him. He couldn't get near the ball. And then Ross Lyons, a great coach, he said he, he could see that. He said, now what you want to do is go up fake and we're going to kick it over the back. And I think he kicked like five goals. And really without that and that small adjustment, if we had picked it up quicker, we would have won by even more. So it's 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 the only team I thought not only could you make it, but you you, you were so robbed in the process. It's it was so frustrating. And you you also forgot to mention there was uh, the the half time when when you the resumption of play in the third quarter. Brian Lake gave probably you know uh, the gentlest of bumps on Rewald, who you know flop, you know did he flop down or was this was that um, was that a hard absolutely. Bump? Yeah, I, I I do remember that, and I have spoken about that last year. That someone did remind me that that was a joke. It was a joke that the umpires they fall for this stuff too often. But you know, the 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 diving and the crap it just showed you how on a knife's edge when you look at all those little things in isolation. Right. We 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 win. Uh, and Revolt, no, he wasn't the toughest bloke, but you know, to to dive like that and to suck. Brian Lake in and the umpires. I mean, Brian did nothing but just stand there. So it was it was pretty funny. But there's nothing worse than after the game. You're talking about all these incidences and you know you know the result is there for you. It's there for you to win. It was very frustrating. Yeah, well, it's like, you know, it's in the books forever. Was that a season we, we could have won it, do you think? Would we have gone on the next week and challenged Geelong? Oh, absolutely. We, we, we always beat Geelong. Like, we had close games, but we had their measure. And yeah, that, that, that next week was uh, ours for the taking, but it's, it's a lot of coulda, woulda, shouldas, but Rodney thinks it's the best team he coached as far as winning best chance. I think it was, as, that was the best season we had. That was the best team I was in for that era. So it was just one that got away yet. You look at the one that the Bulldogs do win in 2016 and how nearly everything that went against us went for us. So, you you know, the universe it has an evening out effect, but it's still a shame. 
Indeed. You could have had four medals there, Hacker. Yeah. Well, that was the plan, but uh, I did play in four grand finals, but it would have been five or six grand finals would have been uh, would have been pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. So in 2010, Aki, Barry Hall arrives at the club. So there's Johnson Hall and Akamanis. 101 years of uh, age there. Did you believe that setup could work? What were your feelings around having that big forward there? Oh, well, it's, everyone said it's what we needed, and he was terrific. I think we won the preseason competition in that year, so we were pretty strong, and Barry was best on ground. But it was the worst thing ever happened to me, really, in that group. I'd gone from leading goal kicker, and the problem was the players just got so Barry Hall-focused. You know, the coaching staff should have recognised it earlier. Barry would take three or four players, and we'd be isolated behind him or on leads. And we could have, we could have won not only – more games easier, but we could have won the competition if the players were just better coached. And it was very frustrating. You go from kicking nearly 50 goals a year before to really getting a, a thousand less opportunity. And that, that really hurt me and hurt my ability to, to influence the team because at that age, you know, we had really strong midfield. So it was hard to go up into the, the midfield area and our rucks weren't that good. So you couldn't, really get on the end of good ruck work. You had to sort of go off the opposition. So, yeah, Barry was uh, great for Barry and, and probably great for the pundits and and him playing that role was good. But it uh, for me personally, I suffered probably the most of any player in that team because of Barry coming. Acker, in 2010 was your 16th and final season. You played nine out of the first 10 games of the season. Everything was going well. But also it was clear that there was a divide between you and the group why did this happen and also I've, I've listened to your Mike Sheehan interview which was I thought was magnificent by the way and you 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 said that there was a lot of compromise compromises made on your heart but how did you manage to handle that that outside the game tension and stress and still play so well and so consistently well I've always been able to do that I, I think it wasn't everyone. It was just a small select group of players. I think a couple of things happened that were, were disappointing. Uh, sort of, I did some columns. They were all good. The gay column, for some reason, Robert Murphy and Ben Hudson just couldn't handle it. I don't know why. I still don't know why. But the other thing that happened, I got injured. The only two times I've ever been sacked, I've both had uh, hamstring tendon issues, which I never had really most of my career hamstrings maybe but hamstring tendons are, are notoriously hard to, to get back from quickly normally at that stage when i was just getting uh nearer to the point of of uh getting sacked as it were i couldn't quite just come out and play great footy and that that's the two times i couldn't do that the two times i got sacked so it just shows you how fickle the game is i mean all of a sudden you're not playing well or i, was, I think i was in the twos at that stage and then you're you're out you're out of the system you're you're of no value. So I think the outside stuff to me, I, I dealt with that all the time when I was in Brisbane, I'd write columns, I'd be on TV and radio. And I don't know. I just, I, I, I talk about like, I just get in a bit of a trance when I play, play footy. Once I'm there, my brain just ticks into this really great mode where that's all it knows it can do. And that's all that wants to do. And it just gives all its energy to that. Doesn't ever think about anything else. And I think that's a, my, my old coach, Lee Matthews, would always say, you're the best in the world I've ever seen it, compartmentalising everything. You come to training, you do that, you do the column, you do that, you do the, you know, you got physio. And it just, it was just something I was really good at, not getting sidetracked by other stuff. So, yeah, I mean, the players, like Scotty West, who's still a mate of mine, so it's not not a big issue. But Scotty was, uh, I don't know about the handstand. And then I had guys like Matty Boyd, um, who was... Uh, you know, I think you're, you're too individual. And then we had a, uh, a bad experience with, we had leading teams at that stage, which wasn't working for the group. It certainly didn't work for me. In fact, I hated, the, I hated it. It was, it was just pop psychology when I'd come from such a strong profiling professional psychologist in Phil Jauncey to this, which was ex footballers telling you, you know, what to stop, start and keep doing. It was, it, it, there was all these issues going on. And in the end, what got me is I in Brisbane, it was me and Lee. The players, my mates were on my side. They were fine. Like in the end, 
I'm mates with all of them. So even now, so there wasn't an issue as strong as it was with the Bulldogs. It was all the power base. I actually probably found out only recently the 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 real culprit was the guy that no one expected. It was it's a bit like a a classic murder thriller because Robert Murphy and Ben Hudson and Daniel C- Jensen and Cusa, uh all all kind of giving you a bit of grief. But then you know you had Brad Johnson who was really pretty good. It, but in the end, I said to Rodney, Rodney, mate, you're the leader. If you had have just said, and and this is what disappointed me about Rodney, if he just said, listen, he's here to play. He does it so well. You trust him on the field. Off the field, yeah, you could take it or leave some things, but they're your problems and don't bring them to the table because that's what was happening. They were, they were basically petulant little kids having a sook all the time. But the real guy in the back row was probably Campbell Rose. Campbell Rose couldn't handle the attention I was getting and he didn't understand it. And he, he, he didn't understand that unless you've killed someone or you're going to jail, that any publicity is good publicity. You know, I went there, it was 21,000 people showing up for a Bulldogs game. When I finished there, it was 38,000 people. It's not just because of me, but he just doesn't understand that Melbourne is a place that while we don't need all the publicity or the, you know, the media coverage, because we get that. But the other side of it was important too. And he just, man, he just had an issue with it. And he was in the background causing me all kinds of grief. Wow. Well, you're connected with the fans, as you say, Aka. You know, we put it out there. We've we've got um, an online forum that there's um, tens of thousands of people on. And we just got flooded when we asked people to sort of comment on you and the love that they've shown you. You know, people are just saying, tell him we love him. This is Brian Green on Facebook. We loved everything about him. We love the, ha- the, the handstands. Yeah. Shane Edwards said, you know, on behalf of all dog fans, we apologise for what happened. Um, we loved him, says Jill Marinelli. We loved everything about him. You're a legend. Um, and it went on and on and on. Um, you know, you brought people through the through the turnstiles. Dougie, you know, talked about that as well. You know, is there is there a place for individuality these days? You know, we had the Mark Jacksons of, you know, of the 80s. You know, we had some the Warwick Cappers. These people, you know, brought people to the gra- to the game. And, you're, you know, you're in that, the, you know, that group. Um, yeah. Are we sanitised? You know, what, um, is there a place for, for character? Always. And there are lots of characters still in the game. You have more of an expression these days. Like, you could only see me if I was writing columns on TV, on the radio. But now you've got Instagram, you've got Facebook, you've got all these social media platforms, which makes it a lot easier to access, you know, players and it's it's got its bad side, you know, with the fans and when they get upset, all the people that bet on players and and uh, some of the 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 negative stuff that people say that's that's not really called for. But you know, and I I love the fans. That's the thing that always it, it uh, is a rod in my back is the way that it finished because in the end, had the Bulldogs said, "Look, we're going to sack you, but we're going to give you one game," every fan from the Bulldogs and the Lions and the Bears, they would have come watch that one game. And they do it to players. They got a whole lot better at it after I got sacked. I think everyone went, oh, I don't think we should do that to our players. Yep. That uh, I mean, you were, for everything I've given to the game, I, I just expected that one thing and I never got it. And it's, it's always just, you know, I would have come out of retirement for it. And in the end... You know, we had that final series, which I wasn't part of in the prelim final, and we we got some injuries. I would have been good to go. Yeah, it was just such a fuck up, like the whole the whole way they went about it, and it just it 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 doesn't eat me up every day. But I can tell you that there's there's so much sadness in that the way it, it ended. Yeah. And look, and you've answered the question I was going to ask you, which is no fitting farewell, no lap of honor, uh, Aka. How does that is that does that sort of uh, uh, incomplete conclusion to your career after look you know we read out your accolades just before it's just in, in, incredible does that still burn a little bit with you? Absolutely, yeah. It's the only thing I think they could have afforded me. That didn't, that didn't need to give me respect or anything, but for the for the standing in the game, like if it, if I had played and then finished in the prelim because we didn't win, that's that's okay too. But the fact that I had you know, these absolute Muppets say, mate, 
no one trusts you anymore. You can't play the game or because a couple of blokes had a couple of issues. And the reality was I just didn't do what they said I should do. It didn't affect them. It didn't affect the game plan. It didn't affect the, the way I played and went about it. It was such horseshit. It really was. So that, and, and to get sacked like that, like uh, with Brisbane, it was me and Lee. It was, I mean, in the end, he just cracked the sads and he said, I've had enough. But that, that was, it was, there was not much in it. There was so little in it. And in the end, all those blokes, whether they say it publicly, they've all stated we, we went about it wrong and, and we apologise for that. And so they should. Yeah, yeah. So so I guess have you mended that, you know, it, over time, has, uh, Bridge has been mended, you know. Can you come down to the club? Because play, we would love to see you down at the club. Um, you know, ha, has that healed enough for you to, to be, to return to the kennel? I don't think so. No, I, I think, um, yeah, I've, I've never wanted to step foot in the place. I don't say that I won't and that I wouldn't be welcome. There was just, there was still, there's still some people there that, that, that I don't want to see. So when they go, maybe it'd be fine, you know, but I've done some functions up here for the Bulldogs when they came to town last year. I do a lot with the lines, of course, naturally where I can. So and I haven't seen the, the new lines uh, sort of sp- facilities which are unbelievable to the west of Brisbane here but I have no doubt that at some stage I'll, I'll pop down there whether anyone sees it or not it's another thing but yeah it's not uh, I'm not going to not forgive what happened uh, at, but I'm also know that I'm you know if I'm welcome I'll, I'll naturally come down and say good day because it's it's still 77 games in my life and some really wonderful footy yeah. that I played and, and nearly the ultimate success well, this podcast goes out to, you know, the, the broader Bulldog community. And I know that the past players, um, you know, love watching this. So past players who are watching this, get on the phone, get get on to Acker and show him some love. And, you know, we'd love to see you back down at some of the past player functions. And um, I know the supporters will just embrace you. Uh, there's no doubt about that, Acker. Um, now, Acker, you are a very broadly skilled person, both on and off the field. Since your playing days, we understand, obviously, you're up in Queensland now and working real estate. Um, you've doubled in coaching, you've worked in the media. So you've got a lot of strings to your bow. Um, we'd like to hear a little bit about that, Paul. When you coached up Norbury Wodonga, I, I came from the Shepherd. What 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 was the coaching experience like there for you, mate? What did you did you let players, you know, those individuals do their thing, or did you find that you did you surprise yourself as being a coach? No, absolutely. I just I love the individuals doing their thing. I think uh I'm one of the most tolerant people for for people with difference probably because of myself but yeah I, most part of it was enjoyable it was a bit of a shame I couldn't get a job in the AFL I, I tried but no one give me a job well who knows what opportunity awaits you Acker obviously with your um your connection with Dale Morris up in Queensland perhaps he can pull a few strings and get fags to give you a call and um, join the Brisbane Lions imagine you tutoring a Charlie Cameron or a Camarena um Having said that, though, we do not want you to impart your knowledge on an opposition um, team. So perhaps a Cody Waitman and uh, a return of the dogs would be a very welcome side. Or an Arthur Jones. Imagine you coming back and um, and adding a few tools to his trade. You're happy where you are, mate, and you're selling real estate and using your name to affect and your branding. and. Yeah, yeah. Real estate's always hard. It takes you many years, but, you know, this is my yeah. third year now. That that bit's been really good. Yeah. I, for for my life, like, uh, Brisbane is always my happy place. Like, it's always yeah. the place where I succeed the most. Uh, Melbourne was good, but didn't quite get where I thought I could get. Albury was probably the reason I went to Albury is for work. But it, it, if I ever become a billionaire, it's because of what happened in Albury, which is ironic. But here my friends and all my family and my life and, and my earning capacity, like it's just unlimited here. Um, before we say goodbye, we always end off on a quiz. A bulldog. You're going to love this, Eka. You're going to love this, mate. Oh, Jesus. This is the, that, it's not a quiz. It's the quiz, Eka. <laughs> it is. And we've dropped it on you. And you know what? You you tell us that you thrive under pressure. So we're going to put it right. today, Eka. Um, oh. and, um, we'll, we'll give you a little bit of power. We'll give you two categories. You can choose the one now. Uh, can I just also say the um there's there's a chap called um Noel Brazizi who um who did the artwork for the Bulldog 2016 banner um and he does a lot of incredible art um 
he's actually uh, offered to 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 uh, do a portrait of the player who wins this competition overall. It's currently, believe it or not, your old mate Dougie Hawkins is on the top of the list. So, <laughs> like, if you finish first or second, you'll go head to head at the end of the season. Acker, I'm backing you. Right. This is, this is for the pool room as well. I can make sure. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm you'll in love the this, pool mate. Room. You'll love it. All right. All right. So, so your categories are. Bulldog players who switched Guernsey numbers during their career or Bulldog preliminary finals? Your choice. Oh, I don't think I'm going to be any good at any of these. Um, let's go prelim finals. Prelim finals. Fantastic. Well, uh, you played in two of them, so there will be some questions in here somewhere. All right, here we oh, go. Yeah. Um, okay. your, your time will start after the first question, Acker. Um, right. Good luck, sir. Um, time you. starts now. Bulldogs won their first ever prelim final against Geelong in 1953. True or false? Uh, false. Correct. The 1985 loss to Hawthorne was the start of a chain of seven straight prelim final losses. True or false? True. Correct. Jack Slattery and Merv Hobbs combined for seven goals to help the Dogs triumph in the 1961 prelim. True or false? True. You're on fire. Which Bulldog celebrated a goal by jumping into the arms of teammates only for the goal umpire to signal a point in 1997? Tony Liberatore. Correct. Which Ruckman suffered a serious eye injury in the prelim win against the GWS Giants in 2016? Ah, uh, jeez. It wasn't Tom Boyd. Uh, whatever his name is, Tom Boyd. Don't know. Pass. Jordan Ruffett. Uh, 2010 prelim loss to St Kilda was the career final game for which retiring Bulldog captain? Uh, oof, Chris Grant. Ah, it was Brad Johnson. Brad and Johnson. time is up. Oh, you started so close. the house on fire, Acker. So close. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, we'll tally up the scores and here they are now. <laughs> Not quite right there with Dougie. But uh, you've done a very, very fantastic job, Acker, and um, we want to congratulate you. That's all right. No, it's been good. It's been a good chat. It's been good to be on here. It's, uh, I'm about to go to Jordan, to uh, the country Jordan for wow. the, the TV show SAS Australia. So Barry Hall was on there, of course. So uh, not sure when this is going out. And it's not, not a secret that I'm on it or not on it, but I will be on it. So I've been training every day and turn as i said 46 tomorrow so next tuesday i'll be on the plane and see if we can't pass that that bad boy good oh. on you mate that's great well thanks Aka, for a magnificent interview we absolutely loved having you um and from the bottom of our hearts you know all bulldog supporters um say thank you for for what you achieved um we see you as a bulldog person can you give us the final word any any parting words to bulldog fans and supporters out there now, I love being at the Bulldogs and the fans were fantastic. They really embraced me for what it's worth. It, it, I was never the easiest guy to follow, but I was the easiest guy to find. And I think for the majority of it, I was very pleasant and had a good time with all, all the Bulldogs fans. And we brought you through the gates and we, we entertained you. That's the main thing. We love what we do and, and I hope you, you you love watching us play. We can't play forever, but, you know, keep supporting the club because, uh, you know, one day you won't be here, but you'll be more than happy that you supported a great team. Oh, one on you, mate. Thank you so much for joining us on Inside the Kennel. Jason Ackermanis, ladies and gents. Right, Anytime. Good on Thanks. you, mate. Thanks, Good mate. Thanks, you, Thanks, mate. Thanks, mate. Well, Good work. Blue in my brain, blue in my brain, blue in my brain, oh.